Hi, I'm Linda Mal, and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. And our interviewer, Amy Cardoso, speaks with curator William Ewing about the exhibition, The Polaroid Project, at the intersection of art and technology. Now for Art This Week. Hi, I'm here at the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art with co-curator William Ewing to talk about the exhibition, The Polaroid Project. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. So this exhibition explores the history of Polaroid photography. Um, how did this exhibition come to be and how was it curated? Um, a kind of organic process. I used to be responsible for the European part of the Polaroid collection. Mm -hmm. 4,000 pieces that have been left in Europe because the company thought maybe it would be better to have a stock of photographs in Europe that could be used for exhibitions and publications and things. And this was in the 70s and 80s. The years go by and then 2000 whenever it was, uh, I was served notice by the bankruptcy judge. Polaroid went bankrupt, but they'd be recuperating the collection. I organized an exhibition hoping to find enough money to buy the collection ourselves. That didn't happen. The public response to the exhibition itself, the material, was so positive and excited uh, and emotional that I thought, whoa, this is something that I didn't expect. It wasn't just nostalgia, it was a really positive feeling about this wonderful medium. I thought something more should be done. Um, and I did a, a slightly bigger exhibition following that one in the south of France and I had the same reaction. And so I said to my uh, colleague Todd Brando, who runs the foundation for the exhibition of photography, uh, this could be a fantastic show. Let's do a big show and take the time. So we brought in Barbara Hitchcock, who had been the curator of the American collection, mm -hmm. which was much bigger, it was something like 16,000 pieces. 12 to 16. For many, many years she'd been the person responsible for building it up. Of course she lost her job when the company went bankrupt, but she continues to love Polaroid and loved what she did and, and uh, kept relations with many of the photographers. And I thought, I could only do it if I do it with her. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't quite remember how MIT came in and we learned that they had the collection of the technical archive that we came up with at the intersection of art and technology. The four of us, two curators from MIT, uh, Deborah Douglas and Gary Van Sant, they would handle that aspect and we'd handle the art side. Um, also, I knew the collection, I knew my side of the collection quite well by that time because I'd put that show together. So it wasn't like I was plunging into something I didn't know. And I'd curated a show with, uh, with one of the photographers, Lucas Samaras, many years ago, and uh, although I'd sort of forgotten about that, it all came back once I started working on the project with Barbara. So let's talk a little bit, I guess, about the history of Polaroid. Edwin Land was the founder. Um, he came up with the idea for the camera. Do we know how um, that idea came about? Well, there is a, there's this wonderful anecdote, which um, is, is, makes such a nice story that at the same time, we always have to be a little careful about <laughs> romanticizing it, but it, it would appear that um, in 1943 he was with his daughter on vacation and he took a picture of her and she said, Daddy, why do I have to wait? Why can't I see it right now? And this struck him like a bolt from the heavens and he talks about walking around, I, I can't remember which city he was in, but walking around that evening thinking yes, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And he, within a couple of hours, he had figured out in his mind how it could be done, the whole, the whole thing. And then it took four years to actually pull off. But in his biographies, there are stories about him actually holding press conferences, announcing to the world the, the camera was ready when it wasn't. Uh -huh. He was just hoping like hell that by the time, you know, the, from the press conference to production, he would, he would be able to kind of iron out the difficulties. So he was someone who took, who, took, who took great risks, but essentially he realized that, or he, I think he believed that it was a new way of seeing, that he was giving to humanity something that it hadn't had before. And this 
instant aspect, mm -hmm. seeing something, recording it, and having it. And that's been a, a dream since the very beginning, but as we know, it was a very laborious process from clicking a, a shutter in 1839 and having something come out was an extremely laborious pro process. And he felt it could be done in one step one simple step. The company had an extensive commitment to art um, with Edwin Land being close with Ansel Adams. Um, and Adams actually went and tested a lot of the cameras. Um, do we know? And, and the, yeah, papers, yeah. films, and, and wrote rep mm -hmm. long reports on them. And he actually, um, he also helped distribute the camera to other artists. That first generation, uh, there's a Walker Evans on the mm -hmm. uh, There's a Mary couple. Yeah. 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 Um, that first generation were actually paid right and they, they had to they had to work for their mm -hmm. <laughs> work for their for their recompense and they also started um, buying beautiful prints by famous photographers like uh, Edward Weston mm -hmm. Imogen Cunningham the black like and that. white pieces. black and white as a, as a gold standard mm -hmm. he wanted to be able to show to the engineers and employees this is what we must aim for. Mm -hmm. This Edward Weston is the best, you know, this is what we have to match. Um, that was before what developed as the Artist Support Program. The Artist Support Program was a more conscious idea of enlarging the field instead of having a few specialists. Right. Give the cameras or, and, and, or encourage people to buy cameras and give them free film. Uh, materials and advice and so on to a wider group because those people will kind of suggest new avenues to explore mm -hmm. for our engineers. Very the SX-70 was actually the name of experiments that have been going on for 20 years. Oh, okay. It was only given to the camera itself kind of at the last moment. In fact, he thought of calling it the penultimate camera, the mm -hmm. penultimate. Why? Because a little like Steve Jobs, he didn't want ever to say, this is it. This mm -hmm. is the finished package. Right. He felt he could always improve on something. In fact, Steve Jobs considered him a mentor wow. and called him a national treasure, Edwin Land. So the iPhone followed the same idea. You never, you never get to the end of it. iPhone Even 8, so, iPhone yeah. 9, yeah. <laughs> um, There will be an end of some kind, but it'll only be because we jump into something else. Mm -hmm. So that feeling of um, not being the ultimate was something that guided, guided Land in his thinking about the future. But when the SX-70 came out, it was a finished, a finished successful product ready to be used. Like you said, it was introduced in 72. Um, how did specifically the SX-70 camera change photography? Uh, well, Boy, that's a very, that, that's a really complicated question because I mean, you, you could say it changed photography in a very uh, prosaic way mm -hmm. if you take the filmmakers who, and the set designers and the dance photographers and the fashion photographers who used it in the studio to test. Right, test shots. Uh -huh. So quite obviously their results benefited from having that instant feedback. Before then they would have had to something, you know, Edward Steichen when he was a fashion photographer in the 30s, would take a picture, had to go to the lab, mm -hmm. they'd wait for it to come back. Maybe the whole thing could be done in 20 minutes, but he had to wait for the plate to come back, look at it, and then, and then ask the model to do something differently. And then she did something differently, take a picture, send it to the lab, wait 20 minutes. Now with Polaroid, they're going zzzz, you know, they click, 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 click. What do you think? Perfect. Good. So in a sense, it sped the whole thing up. Mm -hmm. But Aesthetically, and aesthetically it might be that they saw effects that influenced how they then took the, the you know, with their 8 by 10 or whatever it was, they were 4, four by 5 they were doing their shot with. Mm -hmm. Maybe they said, ooh, that effect of light is really nice, I'll use that in my... Like my final yeah. product. So it's very hard, you'd have to talk to individual photographers and ask them that specific question, you know, mm -hmm. did you, your studies with the Polaroid end up changing the way you took photographs with your film. 
And from what I understand, y'all did reach out to some of the artists, and they're going to be represented in the catalog. Is that oh, question? they are. Is yes, that yes, okay. yes. I, I mean, um, and one of them is um, Ellen Carey. Ellen Carey. Yes, who's behind us right now? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. she is indeed. Very imposing yes. too. <laughs> um, the what we did for the exhibition was we so we had the two collections. Right. We went through them. But at the same time, we were calling photographers, contacting photographers, saying, what else have you got? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we tracked things down in other institutions and borrowed it from other institutions. We made a big effort to find work that wasn't in the collection. That, that's the point. We could have simply stayed with the collection, right. but we knew that we'd be missing mm -hmm. things. I love what you said when we were walking through. You said the show portrays kind of the joyful exper experimentation of the artist and how a lot of them felt a lot more free um, you know they weren't they weren't going and shooting these expecting to be in a show, um, and I think you get yeah. that by walking around. I'm glad. Yeah, yeah I'm glad. Uh, I think they were doing it, a lot of it. They're doing it for fun. The the SX seventies were done in the studio. They had you had to go there to be to, to work with the studio, so they didn't know what they were going to what was gonna come out of that. Uh, and it was a lot of failed stuff. A lot of I've seen a lot of. In, when I talk about 4,000 pictures in the Musée de l'Elysée, when I was there, 4,000 pictures, I'd only want to show 400 maximum. Mm -hmm. A lot of uninteresting stuff because it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. So they would do a picture, and that's, that's, that's no good. But they kept them because they were big and expensive, and, and you know, <laughs> they kept them, and they and they gave them to the collection. Cause yeah. So I'm really glad we have them because it taught me how difficult it is to make those pictures. Like, if you take Magdalena Pons here, mm -hmm. uh, they're all beautifully focused and the colors are phenomenally rich, but I bet you she had a lot of disappointing prints. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the light leakage or the, the contrast was wrong or the saturation wasn't right. And she'd toss them out. For every beautiful print, there are probably 10 that she didn't like. I saw a photographer the other day with 4,000 Polaroids. Wow. He'd taken one every day, for, you know. <laughs> and I won't mention the name because they weren't very interesting. But they're bound to be lots of really interesting things out there right. that you just don't know about. Lots of painters used. used. George O'Keefe uh, used Polaroid at one point. Mm -hmm. I only found out recently. Um, David um, Hockney. Hockney is yeah. famous for it, mm -hmm. but there are other photographers, other painters, who probably never bothered telling anybody they used it. Hockney used it in his final work. Right. Mm -hmm. but I'm saying that other people used it as studies. Mm -hmm. As test shots, though. As tests, yeah. Or, or, yeah, just a note, note taking. Mm -hmm. Now they, they wouldn't do it, even if Polaroid still exists, they would do it with an with a iPhone, mm -hmm. right? Anything to have a, a quick record. Mm -hmm. But I think what's interesting, whether you're talking about Polaroid or you're talking about iPhone, is that when you use these things to photograph, even if it's a test shot, it looks a little different than what you imagined. Mm -hmm. And maybe you like the quality, some kind of quality in that iPhone or, or Polaroid, or whatever it is. You like that and you sort of change your other instrument to make it more look look more like that. Mm -hmm. That's what I find really interesting. It's very difficult to know. Um, the artists are super attuned to their visual environment. So if they see a little effect that really works, they just might sort of steal it and not think it's worth mentioning to anybody. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, if, I love if, seeing that. If everybody's taking photographs mm -hmm. and using it, you're bound to have fertilization. You're bound to have things come out of it. And even the people themselves cannot necessarily remember. They might see something, forget where they saw it. And even think maybe they, they, they thought of that process themselves. They didn't really, they saw it somewhere. Um, but it only happens if you have a huge cauldron of stuff going on, experimentation going on. If you don't have lots of people doing it, it doesn't happen. And that's what I think the genius of land was. If you thought, okay, get all these artists in there and they're gonna do a lot of stuff that will not be interesting to us, <laughs> you know? But something, something's gonna happen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome. 
want to thank William for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to cartermuseum.org. That's it for Art This Week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polar.